actually Jonathan Glover has talked about so much. Uh, and because we know about it in tremendous detail with regard to the woodland champs, um, I think Sam Bowles' hypothesis has quite a lot going for it. So it isn't really the case that we feel sympathy for all humans in distress or empathy for all humans in distress. By and large, we do for those that are within the group or those with whom we are familiar and are attached. And when bad things happen to other people, especially if they are people who dress very differently from us or look different or smell different or what have you, we often feel joy. And that just seems to be part of the biological inheritance. Now that isn't to say that it can't be changed and there are ways of, as they say, incentivize, incentivizing decreases in hostility between groups. But it does look like both the close attachment we have to one another within the group and this very easy hostility that Zimbardo describes so well in these simple psychological experiments. That's part of the package. Crappy as it is. And that, so that, we're not um, wonderful. I mean, we're yeah. this mixed thing. Yeah. The, yeah. Okay, well, well, yeah, no. I mean, it's, <coughs> it's, the same, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, she feels a certain kind of joy because she, well, I mean, I'm sure Sam can speak to this better than I. Why does she feel joy, Sam? But I, I think we should acknowledge that there are, there are pathological, oh, okay. in, in a larger context, there are pathological forms of happiness. Happiness isn't the full story. I mean, I have no doubt that the suicide bomber, before he presses the button, is feeling some kind of religious ecstasy. He has worked himself up into a frenzy of belief. So ecstasy, you know, in that context can't be the, the, the answer at the back of the book of, you know, this is, you know, uh, you know this is what eudaimonia is. Uh, there's, there's a, we're, 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 the, ch the challenge is to build a global civil society where, the, where most of us can flourish most of the time. Uh, and clearly suicide bombing is not the greatest strategy for, for that. Yeah, the, the, there's also a literature on this if you want. I mean, you can talk to your artists, but there's a literature on some of this stuff. Tanya Singer some years ago did some work on what was essentially the neural correlates of schadenfreude, which is what you're talking about. And Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA did some work on essentially what is shunning, that when you're, you're somebody's involved in a game, in a scanner, and they're left out of the, uh, left out of the action, you can, you can see pain, pain areas lighting up, being left out. Shun it, it's his first sort of neural correlates of shunning, in my view. I'd just like to add one, oh. one point here, that if you think that morality is about harm and suffering, then you have all these puzzles and problems. How can people enjoy harm and suffering? Um, my view, and I think it probably would go along with, with uh, Peter's, um, is you should really first and foremost think of morality as a team sport. Morality is about binding teams together to compete with others. Uh, when Pat refers to the Sam Bowles hypothesis, the basic idea is if there wasn't war, there probably would not have been religion or cooperation or society. So war, religion, cooperation, those all come together to help us compete and do terrible things to other groups. I don't think we particularly like it when bad things happen to people who are simply different. It's not just that they're different. It needs to be that they are our enemies. And the most savage kinds of violence, or certainly suicide bombing, seems to come about overwhelmingly, according to at least Robert Pape's uh, Pape study of suicide bombers, comes about overwhelmingly when a, a culture that is different religiously has military force on the ground in your sacred homeland. It's like if a fist is punched into the beehive, yeah, some bees will go sting it. Not, I'm not defending that this is a good thing. I'm just saying this is part of the dynamics that led to the rise of civilization. You know, at, at some point, I actually plan to do, this is, this is on, at some point I'd hope to do a program called This Is Your Brain on Comedy. Uh, w one of the reasons is that I re read an Umberto Eco es es essay some time ago, and he was trying to figure out what the, what the, the adaptive advantage was of, of, of not just humor, but of actually comedy. And um, reading around that area and thinking about it, I was looking at also The Art of the Novel by Milan Kundera, and he talks about the same sort of thing, that uh, he has a huge suspicion of cultures or people who are incapable of laughing at things. I'm thinking now about the cartoons. I'm thinking about people who, because a, a poor English teacher named a teddy bear Mohammed was about to be um, flayed or 
it seems to me that if we could find some way of getting some more, slightly more humor into these things, that, that it might be just a little bit more interesting. But Although, ironically, exposure to comedy made subjects more likely to push the man in the trolley experiment. Yeah. It, so, so Bill Maher is in, is in deep <laughs> trouble. If you're in a good mood, you're willing to push the fat guy in front of the train. Uh, well, well, there we go. Uh, so I didn't say I had an answer. I said I was well, interested in exploring. <laughs> Um, has anybody seen Religious? Was it good? Oh, okay. Oh, really? I got Review of one. Um, do, do we, do we, 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 somebody else was down here? Was uh, Oh, Paul used to have it. Paul Zach. I did. Um, Hi, it's Paul Zach. I, I want to suggest... Um, Hi, everybody. I want to suggest a, a way out of this corner of what is the right metric, and that is convergent evidence. So uh, we've looked at an uh, enormous number of societies and correlated trust levels with basically everything we could think of. And you find the highest correlation of about 100 variables was self-reported rates of happiness. So high trust countries are happy countries. Okay? That also goes strongly with low levels of inequality and low levels of infant mortality and religious tolerance and a freedom. These all run together. So I think we can, we can say even in these societies, if there is the occasional riot or someone blows himself up, that's kind of an anomaly. That's pathological if the thrust is towards greater happiness, greater prosperity, greater freedom, uh, more free press, perhaps comedy. Uh, so I think you know, that's the way out of it. We don't need an absolute metric. I'm going to say, here's the one measure. So everything kind of runs together. So these are the countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway. Um, everything seems to be kind of running in the right direction. And the second issue about, uh, I know uh, one of uh, Professor Churchland's uh, students is a colleague of mine. Bill Case Bear, and uh, many suicide bombers are, of course, drugged, and I, he told me that recently. So they really are fairly drugged out. So I'm not sure they're ecstatic when they blow themselves up. No, I, I, well, I think that's, um, I would dispute that claim, but, um, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, there's, you know, a, a couple of anecdotes goes a long way to, be, we are desperate to believe that this behavior is incompatible with psychological health and real religious commitment. And I just think all of the real study of this points to the fact that you can be very high functioning, not depressed. You can be the you know the quarterback of your high school team. Essentially, you you got all the girls, and you think the best thing to do is blow yourself up uh, on a, an airplane to get into paradise. Um, it really matters what people believe, and there's a, and and in the liberal community, especially, that we are desperate to think. It's got to be an expression of some other kind of psychological but, or social but, pathology. But, Sam, with all due respect, Case Beer is head of NATO yeah, intelligence. I, I yeah, yeah, okay, for I mean, Robert Europe Pape, and... I mean, Robert Pape, I haven't read Case Beer on this. Yeah, but and, and I think that, that you know, he, he's looking at the data very scientifically. So I don't think he's just relying it's, on a couple of anecdotes, but whatever. It's the, the people, I mean, the Israeli psych psychiatrists who've studied failed suicide bombers and those who've succeeded, um, the people who studied that, the, you know, intimately looked at the background of the 19 hijackers, you're not finding depressed people with, with personal, especially personal histories of, of being uh, subjugated. You're not finding the, the, the poorest of the poor or the uneducated. I mean, if you look at the 19 guys who attacked us on September right. 11th, yeah. They were well-educated and high, very high-functioning and yeah. deeply religious. And they spent all their time at the mosque talking about the, 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 the pleasures that await martyrs. So, so, what was I think, that? I think they were um, probably soccer players. Where is Scott Atran when we need I mean, Scott Atran thinks right. the problem is soccer. So, you know, you can I can guarantee look at this soccer is not a problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron O'Hara. Um, so I wanted to maybe offer a friendly amendment for um, Patricia for um, your claim of trust as a fundamental basis for morality. And the reason the reason I offer it is because in the neuroeconomics games, they take a definition of trust that's kind of a standard willingness to make yourself vulnerable to another. And so um, from that perspective,